Good afternoon, y'all. Welcome to Trail Talk. Uh, I'm here all by myself today, but uh, nevertheless, we're going to have a great show for you. It is not called Campfire Diversity on the Trail. <laughs> we're in front of our campfire theater today um, instead of our usual studio area because um, we're going to kind of wrap this episode up by giving you just a a really brief glance at our brand new diversity on the Chisholm Trail um, exhibit that we have installed. And um, it's just, we're very proud of it. We're so excited to, um, I don't know, I guess uh, kind of expand people's knowledge and understanding of who the cowboys really were who worked on the trail. And so, um, we're, we're going to um, kick it off here by um, kind of showing you on a map just the trail. So um, just super brief, the, um, the cattle drives, the days of the cattle drives, 1867 was uh, the first really recorded cattle drive. That's kind of a have some weird lines yeah, on sure there. Um, okay, that's okay. Got some kind of weird lines on our um, screen today, but I think you can still see the the main area of the roundup of the cattle where the majority of the wild longhorns lived down here in South Texas, and the trails went north from there. And the Chisholm Trail is this one kind of right here in the middle, splits off partway through Oklahoma. And then one goes to Ellsworth, the other to Abilene. This one that goes to Abilene, that's the kind of the what we usually refer to as um, when we're teaching, we talk about that being the end of the trail. Um, at any rate, during the Civil War, ended in 1865, right? That's two years before the first cattle drive. Um, people had been moving from the Eastern US to Texas. A lot of them were slave owners. And so they brought African-American people with them. And when the ranchers went to fight in the war, they actually left their cattle with the people who worked for them, their slaves. And, um, and so the slaves learned how to handle cattle during those days. But I I'm, I'm guess I'm kind of getting a little bit ahead of myself here. But um, so as you all know, the American spirit, the cowboy, La Quincy Reed said this several times, the cowboy is a unique character to the United States. Yes, there are now cowboys around the world, but they are all emulating the um, romantic hero on the white horse that um, the cowboy have has been, um, I don't know, through the years kind of uh, created that that vision, that, that idea of the cowboy um, is what has, has come out of the stories, the books, the writings about the days of in the, in the West. And at that time, the West was anything West of the Mississippi. <laughs> um, but, uh, and so the, the, you know, there's not much else that really, um, I don't know, represents the United States much more than a cowboy. And it's unusual that this cowboy has risen to this place of prominence because even though there are modern day cowboys, you know, that whole um, way of life has continued. Um, the real cattle drives, the days when the cowboys were, when that movement was kind of created here in the US, that was not even a 20 year snapshot in the history of the United States. I know we're a young country, but still 20 years, you know, that's not that long. So it's um, it's really uh, just one of those unusual things that the iconic cowboy came to the uh, place of significance that he has in our history. Um, but the, the thing about it is that people may not realize that it's estimated between one fourth and one third of the roughly 35,000 cowboys who worked these cattle drives were um, African-American 
Mexican or Native American cowboys. Movies, the role is typically played by a Caucasian, a white person, a European descent person, you know? And so it's really um, kind of an interesting and cool ask, um, thing for us to take some time and focus on who was really on the trail and um, the fact that there were a lot of people groups who were represented. Um, so <clears throat> the the um, the cowboy becoming a cowboy that was one of actually one of the few jobs that were uh, was open to men of color who didn't want to serve in some other capacity. Um, some examples in my research were like elevator operators, delivery boys. If you're talking Native Americans, many of them were looking for a way to be on horseback and be free to ride. You know, they were they were stuck in Indian territory on their reservations. The uh, Mexican vaqueros, they this had been in their blood. This is how they were raised and the things that they knew they brought north and the cowboys who went down to the U.S. cowboys who went down to Mexico, almost everything that the American cowboy does is um, an evolution of what was done in Mexico. From the clothes they wear to even the words they use. We'll talk about that here um, briefly. but. Um, after the Civil War, the Emancipation Proclamation freed these slaves who had been working and taking care of the ranchers' cattle. And so now they had skills and working on the cattle drive was a way for them to be able to use those skills. And, and they were very effective. They were very good at what they did. Um, so African-American cowboys, even though yeah. They were basically welcomed within in the group of cowboys. The the um, the hands that were put together for any specific drive, uh, they were welcomed by all the cowboys. But in many of the towns they went to, they were required to be at a different end of the bar than the white cowboys, or eat at a different uh, tables or even in a different area from the white cowboys. So discrimination existed, um, but on the trail, on horseback, when you're working, that was not a place where discrimination was um, really prominent. Um, now, a lot of the white cowboys had been, had fought in the war. Some of them Union soldiers, some of them Confederate soldiers. And so the way they felt toward people of color, um, just reading some of the books I uh, read from Let's Talk About It last fall, that was in the um, books uh, book club that we are hosting here at the Heritage Center. Um, it, was, um, it was interesting to note the, even though they, they spoke to them in these stories as equals, and the work they were required to do was equal to the work that any cowboy did. The respect was the same, but um, some of the ways they referenced them, uh, were, it was not respectful at all. And um, so it, that, that, uh, that racism, uh, that discrimination, it was, it was still there, but there was something about being on the trail that gave free black, cowboys just you know a, a way to look forward and a promise uh, for the future honestly a lot of cowboys of color did not make the same amount of money as the white cowboys did either um there's uh, one of the books that we read last fall was actually lonesome dove and i you you perhaps have seen the miniseries the book is like 900 pages it was super long but there's one character in there. His name is um, Josh Dietz. And um, he is a very significant person 
in the story just really sacrifices himself towards the end and um he's based on someone that uh a a person of color who was uh, an actual cowboy in those days a completely different kind of um situation but his his character the characteristics of josh deets were uh, the same as um, a man named bose eicher he worked for charles goodnight and oliver loving on the the goodnight loving trail um so let's i want to show some pictures i was able to find of um this crew of cowboys had it's um mixed races um we have there's there's only one oh there's a couple of african-american cowboys um one of uh hispanic descent perhaps a mexican uh vaquero um but just just a evidence historical evidence to the fact that we have um got men of all races working together this next picture um this entire crew are um, African-American cowboys. And you can see, I think one thing that's really important to notice is they all have all the gear that a cowboy needed to perform his job. So I feel like that was probably another thing that was, uh, um, that may, that, that was appealing about being a cowboy is, um, they could dress exactly like the other cowboys. They could, it was a, it was an inclusion thing. You know, uh, being on the trail, um, one person said the West was a vast open space and a dangerous place to be. Cowboys had to depend on one another. They couldn't stop in the middle of a crisis or a stamp, like a stampede or an attack by wrestlers and sort out who's white and who's not. Um, there was a level of equality with among the cowboys, and I love that. And I, I just I feel like that is an important thing for us to um, think about. Pardon me. There's one more picture here of um, uh, some more of uh, the African American cowboys. They had horses and everything. I mean, they were they were a very important part of the drives. Um, Reliable accounts indicate that there were multiracial outfits um, of African-American and Hispanic cowboys comprised two of the largest and most significant groups. Um, in some cases, they made up entire outfits, like the previous picture I showed you. Um, they... Um, there were firsthand accounts of African-American the, though the firsthand accounts of African-American drovers are scarce, those of the Mexican-American counterparts are virtually non-existent. I thought this was interesting. Fortunately, some Hispanic trail hands experiences are preserved in corridos or ballads that Vaqueros composed and sang. So even though finding recorded history about the Black or African-American cowboy is limited it's even less available if you want to research the mexican-american or hispanic the vaqueros who were on the trail i I've, I've kind of you know pondered i wonder why that's the case could it be because they didn't speak english so anything they wrote maybe wasn't ever recorded in english or maybe um maybe they didn't Maybe they were uneducated. So reading and writing were things that they just didn't know how to do. I'm not saying, you know, generally, I'm just kind of generally speaking, not saying a blanket comment. We know that a number of cowboys of all races were uneducated. Um, so, you know, I it's, it's hard to say why those, um, stories why those experiences weren't recorded i feel like it's a huge loss for for history though um that they weren't because we do know that they were there and that they were a vital part of the trail 
Um, <clears throat> cowboys have always followed the tradition of the vaqueros. Let's look at this next picture. Um, they uh, they use the same type of tools, um, their animal management techniques, the way they decorated their possessions, you know, silver conchos and leather fringe and things like that. Those were all things that the, the vaquero wore. Even, I mean, chaps, they have a special name. So the long lariat or lasso, uh, this guy doesn't have one with him. The, uh, the next picture um, is a painting, but we see the lasso here and this guy has um, lassoed this, this <laughs> poor steer, or maybe it looks like a bull maybe. He's uh, got his tongue hanging out there. I guess that got kind of tied around his neck. Um, but the lariat used by cowboys is ba based on the vaqueros reata, which is what they would have called their rope. Their saddle most frequently had a large saddle horn. You can see he's got his hand here on the saddle horn and a raised pommel in Mexican style. The method of roping calves and horses is rooted in vaquero traditions. The shape, style, and decoration of American and Mexican quirts, spurs, and boots are closely related. So this guy's huge spur here. I don't know how accurate that is, mm -hmm. um, but you, I mean, it's, you can really see it. Um, their, their boots with the heels, the tall tops, um, the word they used the words they used on the trails were frequently Spanish. I have learned this word since I started working here at the Heritage Center, never even thought of its origin, but the word remuda, which is the word we use for the extra horses that they brought along on a cattle drive is a Spanish word. Um, cattle roundups were called rodeos and the loop at the end of the cowboy's most important tool was called a lasso or lasso. L-A-Z-O or lasso. The work remained available for vaqueros throughout the Western U.S. until the early 1900s. Um, it says in many Western states, Mexican and Tejano workers made up over half the workforce on ranches. They and the black cowboys rode and worked alongside and were paid half the wage of the Anglo cowboy. Vaqueros seldom received promotions um, on the famous King Ranch in Texas, the one where you get the King Ranch chicken recipe, all that. Um, I think it's down like in the middle part of uh, Texas. Most of the lower paid ranch hands were Mexican American while the foreman or boss was Anglo. Ancestors of the Chisholm, Chisholm Trails Hispanic Vaqueros delivered the first permanent cattle herds to Texas from Mexico in the 1600s. So, and that's what I was talking about on that map. Um, the Spanish came to Mexico. Uh, they brought cattle. They brought their way of um, herding and working cattle, their uh, clothes that they chose to wear, everything having a purpose, not this is a style we like. You know, they their clothes were um, uh, ha were specific to the needs they had. Um, and they drove Texas Longhorns to New Orleans in the 1770s and 1780s. Now, those were the very first cattle drives, but those weren't, um, that wasn't what became the days of the cattle drives that really started in 1867. Um, so uh, we have another uh, picture of some of the caros um, in the 1800s. And again, we notice um, similar style hats. These hats have a little smaller brims on some drawings, paintings, other pictures, um, movies and such. You see the larger brimmed, almost sombrero looking hats that many of the um, Mexican cowboys or vaqueros wore. So um, styles changed, of course, through the years, but you can see that these men all have the boots, the spurs, the, their lassos, their hats, their vests, their bandanas. I mean, they're, these guys are a little dressed up, it seems to me, but nevertheless, they are representing the Mexican cowboy. 
Um, so um, trail bosses would often hire black and Hispanic hands because um, they would work for lower wages than the uh, European or white cowboys did. American Indians also joined cattle drives, especially on the trails through Indian territory. And at least one cattleman praised his Pawnee Wranglers as the best in the world. So um, the Native American cowboy was also on the trail. Now, I, I mean, I don't know this for sure because again, finding information um, about these cowboys is kind of hard to do. I mean, there's a, you really have to dig and dig and dig and change your keywords that even that you're searching, using to search. Um, it, they're hard. It's hard to find this information. Um, there's, there's one um, particular African-American cowboy named Nat Love. Um, so LaQuincy, use Nat Love's story as part of his inspiration for his um, get up and go um, bronze piece that he has created for the, the Heritage Center. Um, and we have information in our gallery right now about Nat and kind of his story of how he came from being, from being born into slavery, was a sharecropper, became a cowboy, went on in his life to um, other successes, but he recorded his, um, I started to say adventures, but he, I, I guess it was probably he journaled. And so he wrote consistently about things that he was doing. And so man, sometimes that is the best information that you can get your hands on is someone's just their daily journal, because there's no reason for them to, if they're, if they're uh, um, accustomed to just writing the events of the day down just to kind of help them remember um, or just out of habit, there's no reason to assume that they completely embellish or, you know, uh, fabricate things that happen in those journals. That Those are great things to get your hands on. Um, so, uh, Let's look at some of the pictures of um, Native American cattle drives. It's hard to see these cowboys from the front. This next picture, um, we have um, a Native American cowboy and an African American cowboy posing for a uh, picture. Another Native American cowboy. A lot of the Native American cowboy pictures I was able to find are more um, present day. Um, and I'll just tell you guys throughout the coming year, um, I really am going to try to focus on by name some of the African American, Mexican American, and Native American cowboys so that we can do, just do a deep dive and kind of walk through some of their shoes um, as they traveled the Chisholm Trail. And um, so we're gonna, we'll be touching on this throughout the year, but um, it's, it's, a, it's very exciting to um, be a source of this part of history and to be able to um, not just uh, educate, but to be able to celebrate and perpetuate these stories. That's part of our mission here at the Heritage Center. And um, so the art history and culture of the American West, the American Cowboy, the Chisholm Trail, those are things that are so important to us here. And we are remiss if we do not include the cowboys of color who were on the trail. And so real quick, I want to just kind of give you a little shot of our um, diversity on the trail here. Um, wonder if we need a little light on it maybe to um, kind of bring it to life. We're not gonna zoom in because we want you guys to come and see this up close and personal. Um, <clears throat> but uh, I'll wait till we get a little light on it. We're, um, okay, there we go, that's, that's better, that'll work. Um, so we have these panels devoted to 
Um, each of the groups we've talked about, the Black Cowboy, the Big Hero, and the Native American. Um, we have this wonderful piece of art from James Loveless that um, is depicting some of the uh, Black or African American cowboys actually working on the trail. And then we have this really cool exhibit piece here that has video and um, just additional information for you. So we really want to encourage you to come to the Heritage Center and um, experience some diversity on the trail with us. Um, we're just, we're very excited. Like I said earlier, we're very proud of this. Um, we're gonna come back over here now. We'll go to our final slide on the um, screen there. Oh yeah, okay. So here also I was able to um, find picture of the Vicero, the Black Cowboys, and some Native American Cowboys there. Just everyone represented on, on one page. Um, Black, Mexican, um, Native American, and White Cowboys worked, ate, and slept in the same places along the trail. Though racial discrimination still existed, these cowboys were treated much better on the range than anywhere else. And we want you to know their story. We want you to know the true story of the trail, excuse me, and who the cowboys actually were. And so we invite you to come and experience that here at the Chisholm Trail Heritage Center. Um, um, and uh, so uh, now we won't be having a trail talk tomorrow. Cindy Parks was on yes, uh, Monday talking about the Duncan Area Arts Hall of Fame. If you don't have your tickets, please go get some because we're gonna be there Saturday night presenting our very first award to our dear friend, Alan Wooten. Um, this will be given posthumous, posthumously to his family. He will be the inaugural recipient of the Lead Writer Award um, from the Chisholm Trail Heritage Center. So we're, we're very, um, I don't know, I'm a little bit humbled to be able to honor him in that way. And I'm very thankful that we have this opportunity. Um, but you guys are gonna wanna join us next week. Um, we're gonna be uh, have uh, some special guests from uh, Crossed Arrows Alpaca Farm, Alpaca Ranch. I apologize to you Crossed Arrows for not having the last word of that exactly nailed down, but um, they're gonna be here with us next week and we'll have another great history lesson for you. And so um, thanks for watching today and we'll see you guys next time. Happy, Happy trails. trails.